All right. All right, let's welcome our guest filmmakers to the front. Come on down. Thank you all for staying with us for Q&A. All right, as we get all of our guests up front here with us, I'm gonna ask them each to take turns introducing themselves, their films, and their role on the film. We'll start with you, Luis. My, my name is what? Your, your name your, and your film and your role on the film. Yeah, uh, so I'm Luis Gerard, and I directed The Wake, I wrote it, I, and I also produced it. Uh, I'm John Gann, and I'm the producer of uh, Miss Alma Thomas, Alive in Color. Emily Skyle, producer, a work of art. Hi, guys. I'm Christopher Palaha. Uh, I directed, acted in, and, and helped write uh, a work of art. Hi, I'm Sylvie Maris. I co-wrote and acted in a work of art. Hi everyone, Steph Pratt, uh, producer, production designer, artist, and dad, a work of art. <laughs> All right, I will ask the first question, then we'll open it up to you. Uh, each of you, please take a moment to sh share with us either what was the inspiration for the making of your film or how you came to be involved in the making of the film. Okay, um, well, the way, the way I, um, came to the story um, when I wrote the script back in 2017 and it, I read back then that year that there had been like I think about uh, uh, mass mass shootings in the US had been about one per day that year and that, that kind of like prompted me to like write something regarding guns and guns in America um, but I didn't want to do it from the the perspective that we had seen before like school shootings, I wanted to tell it from a different point of view and how guns can end up in the wrong place even when we think they're safe and even though the kids are doing something wrong, that was kind of like the angle that I was looking for. It was, I was trying to tell a story that was not as black and white. And also I was, you know, when I f came up with the, the angle to tell the story, I, I thought um, maybe telling it from the point of view of um, a child that, that, that was deaf um, was something fresh at the time. Again, I wrote it in 2017. It's not, it doesn't have the positive vibes that Coda have, obviously, but it's not a feel-good story. But, um, but yeah, that's kind of where, where it came from. Great. Excellent. Um, so I used to be a film festival and arts consultant, and then COVID. So um, I lost all my work. I had nothing to do, and I was driving everyone crazy. And so a friend of mine who's an art collector, uh, knew the curators of an uh, exhibit coming up, or now, about Alma Thomas and convinced them that they needed a film and needed to give me something to do so I'd get off everyone's ass. <laughs> so uh, I, I knew her paintings, but I didn't really know anything about her. I'm a Washingtonian, and I, you know, I, I grew up knowing the artwork, but didn't know anything else. Um, and I said, sure, I haven't made a film in 20 years. I've been running festivals, but I can do this, right? So that's, that's how it came to me. So. You, yeah. First off, uh, Cleveland, Ohio, thank you so much for having us. We're so humbled <laughs> to be here. And you guys boast a world-class uh, facility. This place is amazing. I'm so impressed. And I don't know, Paul, if you curated that block or not, but I love the theme in that. It's really beautiful. So we're super honored to be here. Um, so thank you. Uh, as for a work of art, um, this gentleman right here, uh, he made the first phone call. His daughter, Sylvie, wanted to uh, be and is an actress. I'm an actor and wanted to be and now am a director. And he said, hey, is there any world in which you could just come and maybe, I don't know, introduce my daughter to your agent? <laughs> and I said, well, I think I can, I think we could do something more interesting. I think, what if we just film a few little scenes and then the agents will see her acting with me and if they know me, then it'll kind of be a cool thing for her to have. So almost like a calling card. So I went to their home in, in Carmel, California, and we spent a weekend. Sylvie um, came up with this really beautiful relationship between an uncle and a niece, um, and we sort of bandied about this idea, and there was this idea of, um, 
not directly suicide, but mental health issues, depression, anxiety. And it was something that I think was really near and dear to her heart. And so we just filmed seven scenes in a weekend. And I went home and um, I started watching them. And I called these two and I said, I think we have something more than just scenes. And so a year later, went back, filmed nine more scenes in the course of a weekend. Uh, and then a year after that, we filmed all the underwater stuff in my pool. <laughs> I think that, yeah. All right, we'd love to ask you or to ask some questions. So I can always ask more, but we'd rather hear from you. So let me see a hand. Yes. Um, well, it's a tricky one. Um, this film was actually, um, the bulk of the film was done during COVID. So in some ways, um, it, uh, COVID and that break allowed me to, um, to work through it, finish it. Um, the, so that pause in some ways was beneficial for me. Um, I, I know it wasn't for everybody. Um, but in some ways, yeah, it, this, I mean, this is the first time the film screens. This is my first time watching it on a big screen. Um, but yeah, it was, the bulk of the work was done through COVID and, and that, that break was pretty much, yeah, what, what allowed me to, to have it here to the, tonight. Yeah, I was going to say, I think that COVID forced us to think more creatively. Our film was done completely remotely. Sherry, the director, was in Los Angeles and I was in DC and we would just FaceTime every day. And then when it came time to actually directing the, the interviews, I, we were in a very COVID, we were in museums, so we had to be very safe. The museums are closed to the public, but we had to be very safe. So we had a COVID coordinator and the camera guy and, and me and the interviewee and one other person and no one could be near each other, and she was on an iPad on a, you know, on a stand next to the camera so she could communicate with the, the subjects. It was wild, but I think in a way freeing. Uh, we didn't have like that office banter, you know, talking and blah, blah. We just got stuff done, like as quickly as possible. And we were able to produce this film in, well, from shooting to editing, two and a half months. Like we just got it done. So I think it, for us, I think it, it really, Covered was a godsend in a way. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, for us, uh, the bulk of the film was shot before the pandemic, but um, you know, those underwater shots weren't done until you know last year, maybe. Um, but you know, as the pandemic went on, you know, suicide rates went up, and we felt like it was worth going the extra mile to get those shots for to tell a story like this. Um, especially in a time like this. And one of the beautiful things about uh, COVID was our editor, Barry Wise, <coughs> who's a good, uh, a good friend of mine and was gonna do me a favor and sort of shoot the whole thing out, edit it in a month in February. I gave him the footage and then the pandemic hit and all of a sudden he had an entire year to work on the film. So that was a huge, uh, that was a huge sort of benefit in our favor for the, it's awful, the pandemic was awful, but. <laughs> His freedom was liberating for us. I got to write, and I produce and do a lot of television stuff, and usually just get hired to punch up scripts. So all of a sudden, my my world of the industry went poof, like everybody's, so many others. And so I went ooh, and so I, I got to I got to write a lot of Emily things. And so very that was the one positive for me was being able to write. And now you can pitch your shows to executives. You don't have to fly to LA. They you Zoom. You don't have like a pretentious receptionist judging you and feel chubby when everyone weighs four ounces. And you know, I get to feel super confident in my flannels with my dog on my lap. I'm like, you guys have no idea. So I think it opened up a lot of amazing communication opportunities and pitching opportunities as creators. Let's see hand. Yes, up there.
who helped with uh, making that a ASL feel so yeah. fluid? So basically, um, after I wrote the script, yeah, the, the couple of years after I wrote it, I wasn't really sure I would ever shoot it. Opportunity arose a couple of years later to shoot it. And at that time, there were two options, either do it with an actor who plays um, a deaf boy or go the real path. And um, so a lot of people ad advised me to go with an actor. I chose to go with a real boy, um, in this case, Sander, um, who had never acted before. <laughs> so neither boy was, had ever acted, really. Um, and Sander was really um, <clears throat> insecure because he had never been on camera. He was actually, t I spent like four or five months casting this, looking for the right boys that had chemistry. I did like, I, after I casted them, I, I took them out uh, to different like game rooms and, and like activities like that so they could have that chemistry that you see on screen. Um, so basically, but um, after I decided to go with Sander, I, um, I went to his house because I still had second thoughts about whether he could do the film or not. He, because he, it, sometimes it felt like his mom was more eager to have him do the film than he was. <laughs> so I, I went to the house and, 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 and talked to him. Um, and it was very interesting because now that I saw Coda on my flight here, and Sanders family is all deaf, except for the little sister. He has four, four brothers and a young sister. His dad is deaf um, from one ear, his mom is deaf, um, and all of his brothers are deaf, but the little sister is actually not deaf um, and speaks. So it's kind of like Coda, and that, that, th those hours that I spent with them um, in their house and getting to know them, I, I actually got to learn a lot from the, f the family dynamics, the real thing I saw, like when they wanted to talk to each other, they would switch the lights on and off, they would stomp on the floor, and things that I did not have in the script, but that was like an enlightening process. So there was that, that part of it. Um, so like exposing myself to the family and seeing their dynamics uh, inspired some changes to the script. Um, and then when it came to production, um, yeah, I mean, it made the film a little bit harder to shoot for sure. Um, there were things that I was not really uh, prepared for, like for example, I had to have several translators on set because every time I, I would try to give them direction and wait for them to to give to, to like translate and then he would come back and say whatever he had to say, th the translators would get tired. So every five minutes they would swap. So I had to have two translators and then on th I had a boy that was next to me on set who taught the cast sign language because I, I wanted there's a bit of me that's a perfectionist. So I wanted, if, there, if someone who was deaf ever saw the film, I wanted the signing to be flawless and believable. I didn't want, so I would, um, um, this boy was next to me between every, you know, every shot and I wouldn't move on until he told me it was perfect. And the first person that saw the cut was him. And when he told me it was perfect, then I was good to go with the film. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Before I let our fantastic guests get away and we pack the Ohio program that's coming, Local Heroes, next, I want to find out from each of you what's next. What, what projects are you working on? What are we going to see from you next? I get to go first. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I have, I have a couple of projects that I'm working on. Um, um, I wrote one script. Um, during the pandemic. I actually wrote it last year. Um, it's a project that I really like and it's an idea that's been with me for 12 years now. So I, that's one project that I would love to do. There's another project I wrote a couple of years ago that there's interest and there's people like trying to get money for. Um, and then there's a feature version of this film that uh, is in development right now. So it's kind of work. The, sometimes you have the the feature idea, and then you go and shoot the short. This one kind of worked opposite. I did the short, and now the feature version is being written. Great. Uh, I'm 
trying to get other museums to want to do portraits of famous artists, because this was fun. Um, and I'm working on a possible new narrative piece of uh, a story that just came to me. It's a high school friend whose great-grandmother was evidently murdered uh, in the turn of the century. Um, and he's uh, sort of, after 120 years, uncovered the mystery behind it and sort of has figured out what happened. So. Uh, I have a show uh, that I want you to please watch. It's called Renovations. It should come out in the fall on Disney Plus and stars Jeremy Renner, who's currently Hawkeye on Disney. So please support that show so we get a second season. Um, and then I have a narrative series called Working Stiffs. It's a mockumentary that follows the lives of five people that play dead for a living. So it's a comedy, I promise. It's just dark. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm going to be, hopefully, the one thing that's not funded that needs funding is uh, my first feature film that I wrote called Flip. Which you will direct and rip. Yeah. All right, kids. June 10th in theaters worldwide. Jurassic World Dominion. <laughs> it's just fun. I don't know how big my part is, but it's just fun. I'm in it. Um, we got to film during the pandemic. So to, to answer your question, 2020 was one of those weird years. The bubble, if you see it on Netflix, is technically... I guess about our experience, but Judd Apatow's neighbors with Colin Trevorrow and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, um, so that, that'll be in theaters on June 4th at Lifetime. There's a show called Barstow you should check out. I'm in that. Um, and then since I'm here and you're asking, I, I started writing these romance <laughs> novels. Uh, so the first one's called Moments Like This. You can get it right now. And the second one's coming out in October. Um, I'm currently working on a uh, short about my uncle who passed during COVID, and it's about um, when he kind of took the family car and the family dog and just went across the United States of America and struggled with schizophrenia. Um, and I want to tell that story. Um, I'm also working on a web series called Tooth Fairy about a murderer who steals teeth. Um, and I'm also uh, doing a short called Bootlickers, uh, which is about this woman who's been kidnapped and forced to lick boots. Lots of weird stuff. Um, and I'm also working on graduating from college. So. And my wife, Mano, who worked on our film too, and I are working on paying for college, NYU. <laughs> and I'm always painting, uh, making paintings, um, writing songs, and... Um, I'm thinking of a, a script idea of, uh, I grew up in Portland, Maine. Um, there wasn't any diversity, and now it's this wonderful sanctuary city. And my, my idea is to um, wonder what it would be like to grow up there now with the same aspirations to paint and tell stories about the world around. But I really want to take a moment to thank Paul. To thank, this is surreal. We're to be in this, in this group with these, so these are gutsy, important message films. It's such an honor. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, Cleveland. I think, as I always say, it's just watching movies unless we have great guests like this. So one more time, thank you all for being here. Don't forget to vote. Your ballots are very important on your way out, and we will hope to see you at more shorts programs throughout the festival. Have a great festival night. I thought she was going to say that you did all the artwork in our film. Then.